Um, so in, in the spirit of the, of the new formats of Coffee Mornings, yes. we'll jump straight into the presentation. Um, and it's really great to have John Walsh with us this morning from the School of Earth Sciences. Um, John had, had a very illustrious career and has been recognised for his work through a number of high profile awards, including from the Royal Irish Academy and the Geological Society of London. Um, so we're very happy that he is be, going to be talking with us today about the critical role of faults and fractures in the flow of groundwater within Ireland's subsurface. So thanks very much, John. Grant, thanks, uh, Taz. And I'll put on my timer just so as I uh, uh, see how badly I am, actually, in terms <laughs> of speed uh, through the course of this. So um, this talk is about how faults and fractures affect uh, groundwater flow in Ireland. And it's by a, a, a quite a large group uh, of people. I put the et al is actually telling about a lot of people involved here. But one of the main people is John Paul Moore, um, a PhD student in UCD. Um, and this is the backdrop to, to it. Uh, this is Ireland. And you see the light blue, this is a geological map of Ireland. And the, the light blue, um, can you actually see my face? Uh, hello? Yeah, I, I can, yeah. You can see my face, good, oh, yeah. Brand. okay, so uh, I can, but it doesn't matter. Um, so uh, the light blue is actually limestone. So much of Ireland is covered by limestone. And in fact, groundwater, which is subsurface uh, water, actually uh, is accounts for about 30% of Ireland's water usage. So it's a, a very substantial amount. And a, a lot of it would be isolated wells for farmers and stuff. But in fact, some uh, big area, uh, big plants and big uh, manufacturing uh, sites use it. So for example, the Glambia site is provided by water entirely derived from the subsurface. The limestones themselves are actually quite tight as, as rocks. Uh, you can see them here. They're actually quite tight. They're impermeable. Um, so in fact, what it is, is fractures, breaks in the muck and faults. And um, these are big fractures or faults and uh, related karst. And that's the dissolution uh, of the limestone. So here's a picture from the Burren in the west of Ireland. And uh, I've just put lines over this. Uh, you can actually see that the limestone is dissolved out along fractures. And that's because acid rain gets into the fractures and then it opens up. And of course, these are in the subsurface uh, in the central part of Ireland. Uh, but in fact, uh, within the Burren, and I'm going to be showing you examples from the Burren mm -hmm. and from the Aran Islands, uh, these limestones have come up to see you. So you can actually look at the fractures. You can look at the dissolution. And that would be in the roughly in the subsurface uh, uh, in the central part of Ireland. So uh, we're going to look at, uh, these are our fractures, we're going to look in the Aran Islands. Uh, these are the three Aran Islands. And I think you can probably see that in fact there are lines. Can you see stripes going through here? In fact, some of the little bays are defined by these lines. The breaks between the islands are defined by these lines. We're going to blow up and you see these scales. So this is a 10 kilometer scale. So we're going to be getting into this area a five kilometer scale. And you can see these lines again. This is all limestone. And you can see the layers of limestone. They're actually dipping to the south. But in fact, all of those lines in a north north easterly direction are all fractures. And they're all being dissolved out. Some of them are dissolved out to actually provide separate islands. And some of them are dissolved out to provide some of the more obvious bays in this area. Um, so we're going to get closer to that again and zoom in, so five kilometer scale bar to two kilometer scale bar, even clearer, lots of fractures, lots of bays. So today's bay is tomorrow's uh, uh, gap uh, and we end up with two islands. So uh, the actual erosion of the area and also the subsurface flow, so we're actually dissolving down with depth is controlled by these fractures. We're gonna get a bit closer uh, just see Dunangus there, for those of you who are archaeologically uh, uh, leaning. Here's Dunangus here. Dunangus has been eroded. Um, and here's our fractures again, really very clear. In fact, do you see this little rectangular block? That's palnabased, and that's bounded by these fractures. Um, so we're going to zoom into that for 500 meters scale bar, 250 meters scale bar. This is palnabased. This is perfectly natural. It's actually a place where people dive. You can get, I think it's a 20 or 30 meter dive. But you can see the whole terrain and in fact, the fractures of the surface are all controlled 
and on the cliff are controlled by these, uh, the whole geometry of the cliff is controlled by these fractures, these north and northeasterly fractures. So we can get a bit closer. We're going to go to Palnabesh now. This is Palnabesh. We're looking south. These are people. And so this is, this is all fracture controlled. What's happened is that uh, fracture controlled block has just dropped out. It's been under eroded, obviously, at the sea. And then a block from this limestone has dropped out uh, perfectly. It just looks like somebody sliced it. But these are all fractures, all fracture controlled and dissolution controlled. We can get a bit closer. And if we just look at areas which are just fresh from uh, erosion, we can actually see that these fractures have a vein infill. It's calcite. We're down to one meter here. So these veins, these fractures occur on all scales down to tiny little ones. You can see they're actually clustered. They're little clusters of them. These are blasts of veins. They're actually hydraulic fractures and they developed about 300 million years ago. So um, if we look at the burn, we've been looking at the Iron Islands. We look at the burn, we've got these structures are still there in the burn. Uh, a lot of the uh, groundwater flow and the uh, fracturing and terrain is controlled by it. So clusters of calcite veins. So this is car calcium carbonate and just all the acid rain is etching out these down to depths of a few hundred meters. They're all standard uh, orientation. They scale on a broad range. They actually have power law scaling without getting into it. Uh, there are large veins down to small veins um, and they're produced actually by north-south compression. 300 million years ago, uh, Spain and France collided with Ireland and it squeezed things north-south and it produced these veins. And these veins are produced by hydraulic fracturing. I'm just going to show you. Uh, we get this uh, system which is not properly scaled. It's basically all the same size. So, um, in fact, if we look at uh, caves in the burn, and this is a map of caves in the burn, 200 meters, this is one cave. You can see it's controlled by these fractures. The fractures have been etched out. In fact, if we look in the subsurface, we can walk in the caves along these fractures. This is a big, thick vein. And do you see these fragments, the gray fragment there? This is an explosive hydraulic fracture of 300 million years old, and it's controlling cars, to, it's controlling flow. So I've just talked about one type of fracture. I'm gonna talk about another type of fracture. These are alpine strike slip faults. And these strike slip faults happened in the last 60 million years. We didn't even know they existed. Here's a map here in, in deep color here, which is actually showing the magnetic properties of the rock in the subsurface. And can you see these lines going off in a northwesterly orientated direction? In fact, those lines are dikes. They're igneous intrusions, and they really light up in the magnetism and are a magnetic character. And these are faults, and they offset those lines. And up until uh, within the last 10 years, it's only that we've discovered these exist. These are massive big faults and they're actually recent. Well, geologically recent, about 60 million years. They have big displacements on them. Do you see that? This has a, a sort of an anti-clockwise mo motion on these faults, which are, which are northeasterly, and then a clockwise motion on these faults, which are northwesterly. This fault here, which goes down by Dublin, um, it actually intersects with these other faults and it gives us Loch Ness. So Loch Ness is where these alpine faults intersect. You generate space and all sorts. So it's affecting terrain, but it's also affecting flow. This fault, the Codling Fault, has nine kilometers displacement on it. It's a whopper. And we never even knew it existed until within the last 10 years. And if we zoom into it, um, it's a, these are all caused by north-south compression. In this case, it's the Alpine. It's sort of like Africa sort of colliding with uh, Northwestern Europe. And we uh, squeeze and we end up with these conjugate structures. Do you see these V-shaped structures, which this sort of block is shoving in? And uh, we know that these exist now, but it's only recently that they were defined. We can go closer. And here's a map here of the offshore of Ireland. And you see in, red, in yellow and red here is sniffer data, hydrocarbon data. They're sniffing hydrocarbon coming up at the seabed here along the Codling Fault. So these are important structures, they affect the terrain, and they expect, affect fluid flow. In this case, it's actually hydrocarbons. We can take it a little bit further. Lachine mine is down with that red dot. This is looking at mine data. 
And it's also got all of these sorts of structures. These are all uh, these clockwise rotating structures produced by north-tail compression. And these have a huge effect on flow. In fact, one of these faults, and I can't remember which one it is, is a has a flow of 33,000 cubic meters a day. That's about 15% uh, of Dublin's daily water usage. And it's a very small fault. And all this karst and dissolution extends down to depths of a few hundred uh, meters. We can go back a bit closer to home again, uh, back to uh, Dublin in this case, there, there we go. And Huntstown Quarry, do you see all of these faults? These are all we think recent structures, relatively recent. And they have flow on them. They have slightly elevated temperatures. So there's a bit of a geothermal uh, in, uh, indication here. And, and you can see all the flow has happened because all the rusting and there's water coming out here, 5,000 cubic meters a day here. And we get lots of them. And we can look at quarries and John Moore, a PhD student in our uh, group has looked at those and they're everywhere. These are ubiquitous structures. They are structures that we didn't really think were affecting fluid flow. Um, but in fact, we know, know that they're probably the most permissive structures, the most transmissive and important from a groundwater flow point of view. And we've looked down south at seismic data, very recently just published a paper in which we can image on the seismic, look at all these faults, they're everywhere. Uh, these are all alpine structures and this is just off the south coast of Ireland. So these are effectively really important from a flow point of view. So just to sum up, we've got two types of structures, these old veins, which are also, they don't have a characteristic scale, but they're etched out and karstified and they end up controlling flow. We've got these faults produced by alpine collision uh, north south and they're less than 60 million years and they also affect flow. These are heterogeneous structures, heterogeneous flow, uh, no characters, uh, characteristic scale. And luckily from our point of view as geologists, that means we must define the local structure, which means we have to go to these terrible places with all those gorgeous views and all these lovely rocks and uh, try to uh, get a grip on, on how the water flows within them. Anyway, that's me. Sorry, Emily, I was uh, one and a half minutes longer. <laughs> Thanks very much, John. That's good timekeeping in, in, in our world um, yeah. um so that's fascinating and yeah revealing of, of things that i hadn't really at all appreciated before um i was it's interesting you, you, you mentioned loch ney specifically as being established through the through the faults yes would that be true of, of a, a good number of other lakes in, in ireland as well or and there are some indicators, for example, if you if you look at uh, the likes of Loch Ern and stuff, do you see these sorts of orientations yeah. here? Yeah. We, we believe that these are relatively recent structures which have been um, uh, uh, dissolved out. And John Moore, for example, has gone to the caves there and actually described them. So, I mean, it, not only have these faults really sort of not really been described only in the last 10 years, but in fact, their effect on groundwater flow is, is really only very recently in the last few years been established. But I, I think in terrain terms, there's a broad equivalence. The faults that affect uh, terrain in limestones uh, are uh, often the ones that which are likely to be affecting the flow. And, and is this knowledge being applied to the kind of challenge of water supply here? You uh, mentioned kind of 30% is there, but it's mostly ad hoc. Is, is it being embraced it, in a bigger way now? Well, it should be, and, and I think it will be, but it's probably up to us to actually sort of uh, articulate and communicate this better. I, I think people can see uh, over the last few years, they see that it's really important. And we have to become more, um, it, it's often tempting to consider hydrogeology. So that's the flow of water and rocks as being like an equivalent porous medium. You can average it easily. The problem with these rocks is that you can't average them very easily. And that demands you to really know what the structure is because it's faults and fractures that control it. And it's the karst that develops upon them. So, um, so it does make things challenging, but um, uh, you're yeah, rolling out this knowledge and people targeting structures like this if they want uh, groundwater flow is the sort of thing that we need to be doing. And uh, uh, it's, the word is getting out, but it's, I wouldn't say that it's been applied uh, greatly yet. Does anyone else have any, any questions? Just a comment, uh, Taz. Um, yeah, I mean, where you see the the 
water supply coming from groundwater. If you look where there are boil water notices that have appeared in the past, you'll probably find there's a strong correlation with your karst because the water flowing through those fractures isn't filtered the same way that water flowing through um, uh, sed well, sedimentary type rocks is. So that yes. the E. coli, not, not only does it travel faster uh, through the fractures, but it, in fact, there's, there's very little filtering. There's one very nice ad, sorry to keep going, but there's one no very problem, nice Neil. A water company, and they show the water dripping down these lovely limestone fractures and saying, this is where we get our pure water from. But in fact, it's... <laughs> <laughs> so this could be where you get your E. coli from. <laughs> so, uh, but no, you're quite right, Michal. Uh, if there's one thing that these rocks are characterised by, it's the, the flow, the groundwater flow is very flashy. If you get a lot of rain, then the, the uh, flow rates are rapid through these structures. And you're quite right. There's really much less, perhaps, residency and uh, stripping out of whatever nasty business there might be. Um, so they're, they're, they're really very heterogeneous. And uh, uh, they can go straight from whatever source you have to uh, you. Nasty business. Yeah. That, that flashiness, I guess, I think it is well well known as a as a hazard for cave cavers. D does it does it also lead into hazards hazards for us? Is, 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 does, does water arrive very quickly in, in places that it can flood? Society yeah. winds flowing through through there. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I'm not an expert on this. Uh, people like me all know more about it, and uh, also uh, people like Lauren Skill who work on these things. If there's one thing that has happened is that we're suffering from more floods now, and uh, obviously with climate change. And uh, uh, that presents challenges in Ireland, of course, because we get uh, a lot of flooding and turlocks. And, and also sometimes we get peculiar behavior. Um, because if you look at these uh, subterranean car systems, uh, there, there's nothing really linear about them. You know, if you get incredibly high flow rates, you can end up with flow going the opposite direction because these are three-dimensional frameworks and, 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 and geometries and linkages. And, and so, uh, for example, in, um, in the Burren, uh, uh, Lawrence Gill did some work, they actually injected in some tracer. They expected the flow to go the opposite direction. They expected to go south, but it actually went north. And they're thinking, how did that happen? And, uh, but the thing is that these are really quite complex pathways. And, and John Moore, uh, a JP is there actually, and uh, he's, he's worked on a lot of this sort of uh, the complexity. Uh, he's looked at the cave geometries, for example, the scaling of them, and they look like fractal things. So they're on a broad range of scale, which means there's all sorts of percolation and, and connectivity issues with, with something like this. It's not conducive to the uh, uh, simplistic sort of application of, of, uh, of averaging tools, but th that means that there's a, an importance placed on geology, which of course we're all for. Because we, like we like looking at it. <laughs> and it has to be worked out on a on a bed yeah. by bed basis, basically. Yeah, you that, can't that's really a general a general prediction. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Anybody else with, with comments or questions? Hi, John. Um, sorry if I could have to ask a quick question. Um, this is James Steer. I'm working on a project looking at breaking waves on the Aran Islands. Ah uh, yes. So, um, so I was I was wondering. Uh, you spoke about um, sort of dissolving limestone along these very straight faults, and I was wondering whether this is one of the major modes of coastal erosion. I.e., um, you get dissolving along these faults, and then you have large waves coming in and breaking off large chunks of limestone at, at one time, creating these really massive boulders. Yeah, I agree. Uh, in fact. Uh, I was, we're putting, putting together a bit of a paper on the Aran Islands. In fact, I put in the Aran Islands because I knew people like you, James, were going to most likely be here because of F, um, F Frederick and stuff. Yeah, it's very interesting. Me. And, uh, but if, uh, are, are we sort of suggesting that really Aran Islands are being produced by the dissolution uh, of these uh, fracture oh. systems. And, and the bigger of the fracture systems are the ones that are producing the islands today the dissolution, yeah. whereas the smaller ones will produce smaller islands later maybe. 
And so uh, the Aran Islands was probably most likely just one uh, high, uh, but it's actually been uh, dissolved out and, and, and discretized into all sorts of little islands. Yeah. Uh, we think the karst is implicated in that. And if you just look, for example, if you look at the terrain along the length of, of uh, Inishmore, you can actually see the terrain just looks fractal. Yeah. And, and it's, it's a fantastic sort of looking uh, sawtooth pattern. And, and of course, what you're doing is you're taking structure, which is already clustered. And then you're on top of that, you're accentuated by putting in flow and you really start stretching out and, and uh, varying the amount of dissolution depending on these structures. And, and then of course, your waves are actually being localized along these and into these weaknesses and so on. Yes, right. And can I, can I just ask, does the salt water make a difference in the, um, does salt water dissolve limestone faster than fresh rainwater? Do you know what? I have no idea. All right. Okay. I have a suspicion. It, it'll dissolve limestone. Of course it does. But uh, I think acid rain is probably the best way of actually dissolving limestones. Sure. But there's no doubt that seawater can do it. Because if you had an acid sea, then you're in business. You wouldn't have an iron islands at all, which would be terrible. But uh, yeah, so I'm not advocating that. Um, uh, we've done a damn good job getting acid rain into this atmosphere. So, um, but uh, no, I, I think seawater definitely does dissolve. But there are better chemistries for doing it in acid right. rain. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I'd be very All interested right. to hear about your um, your paper on the Air Islands coming out. Oh yeah, well, it's not written yet, James. So oh, okay, right. <laughs> Keep us up to date, thank you. The, yeah. the seawater is getting getting more acid, of course. Yes. Uh, quite, quite dramatically so in some places, so yeah. Yeah. Watch this space. Exactly. <laughs> Any other thoughts Any or more? comments or, or questions? No. You're all very quiet. Anyway, um, I, I was I put this in for an answer, and uh, <laughs> it's it's basically uh, people saying, well, "How does the Alps affect deformation in Ireland?" Well, in fact, you know, there's a general sort of northward motion of the likes of Spain and uh, Italy and Africa. And that's been happening over the last 60 million years. And Ireland, although it's not at the locus of where that squeeze is, we don't have an Alps, we don't have a Pyrenees, but we, we have sort of like a, a pretty low grade sort of equivalence of that. But that it has been taking a bit of a hammering. And uh, just the fact that we've actually found nine kilometer faults with nine kilometer displacements, I mean, it's not a San Andreas fault. The San Andreas fault is 350 kilometers, but nine kilometers is, is better than a dig in the eye. And it's not something we ever knew existed. So uh, yeah, that's the rationale for uh, this sort of alpine or Pyrenean uh, deformation, those arrows show you the movement. Okay, so it's, so it's the deformation that, that, that led to the Alps. It's, it's, yeah. yeah, and that was only sixty million years ago. It's all within the last sixty yeah. million years. Yeah, okay. yeah. In fact, it's yeah, it is. It, there, there are a couple of little sort of collisions, um, and uh, it's uh, they've all produced the Alpine and Pyrenean system. Yeah, it's, as you say, it's it's really striking when when major structures are, are, and and from my point of view, species are, in, as a biologist are being discovered. All the time, you know, and as you said, but that, that yeah. big displacement there right off our shore, only kind of come, coming to like 10 years ago. Right? Yes. But, you know, it's, it makes science a very exciting place to place to be, for, for sure. It does. And it, it's, uh, it's one of these things, it just gives you sense. I mean, I, I, I've, I've said, we've now found some weird things offshore. And uh, when I was taught in UCD uh, between 1976 and 1980, I mean, everything was old. It had to be old. You know, it was all three, four hundred million years old. That was it. Uh, we had old geology because you can get new structures in old rocks, and uh, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing lots of new structures in old rocks, and uh, and they're having their time now. 
because we're sort of looking through them and, and we're not saying, well, actually, these are all rocks. So whatever happened at the time that they were formed, we're saying, well, whatever happened to them in the last 20 million years? And that opens a, up a completely different window. If you look at rocks in terms of not what happened during their age, but what happened since it, uh, you see radically different things. And uh, I think that's one thing that we've found over the last, or I've certainly, uh, I started looking at old rocks, so, uh, but I've come what we describe as up in the crust, yeah? <laughs> up in the crust geologically. And yeah. I'm looking at younger things, even if there are younger things in old rocks. Yeah. Younger, crustier things. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, a bit like myself. <laughs> So, yeah, and I saw, a, um, I saw a new story this, this morning about a, a 500 metre high coral, piece of coral just on the, just off, off the Great Barrier Reef to the north that, that no, one had, no one had seen before and spotted before and found with surveys. Yeah, and it, it's and, incredible how exploration offshore, in fact, you know, whether, for whatever purpose, it's really discovered a lot of new things. But even onshore, I showed that magnetic data, which they had acquired, and they've done it all over the whole of Ireland now. I mean, that's that's like a, uh, a really sort of turned up things that we we are very surprised at. We never really anticipated. So, uh, yeah, there's plenty to find out, yep. which is great to keep it us is. off the streets. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a good place to live. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks okay. for John, that's really much appreciated. Uh, you're welcome. And, and thanks, everyone. <coughs> and, uh, Great. See, thanks, see John. Yeah. Thank you, John. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. All right.